Good evening and welcome to this Centre for the History of People, Place and Community Seminar. Um, I'm, my name is Adam Shepard and I'm the chairing this evening. Um, come, uh, very pleased to introduce um, Dr. Joe Chick and Vesna Kurlich, who are our speakers tonight and uh, have been uh, this summer. Our uh, interns paid for um, by the generosity of um, some of the supporters of the IHR. Um, and they'll be telling us about their projects over the last few months. Um, bear in mind that as a centre, we are uh, engaged in a variety of research related to people, place and communities. And we're currently looking for early career um, researcher members of our advisory board. I'll pop the link to the blog giving more details in the chat. Uh, we'll say more about that later. So uh, our speakers tonight are Joe Chick, who um, well, as the university, he's got his PhD from the University of Warwick and has researched into urban society across medieval and across the traditional medieval early modern divide, looking at the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries. And his work to date has been focused on English monastic towns, um, defined as settlements where a monastery was a lord of virtually the whole town. And some of these form the examples um, he's done in looking at the VCH app, the history of English places. Um, and he's devised a series of guided walks, which can tell us more about on some of those places. So Joe's going to talk to us first. I'll introduce those in more detail uh, when it's her turn. So um, without more ado, it's over to you, Joe. Thank you, Adam. I'll just uh, switch on, hopefully, my PowerPoint. There we go. I assume people can see that, but shout at me if you can't. There we go. So uh, yeah, like Adam said, I completed my PhD last year and I'm um, uh, going to be starting a uh, project at, uh, as a research assistant at King's College London quite soon, uh, which I'm looking forward to doing. And I thought, first of all, I might uh, talk a bit about uh, my own research area, just so you know where I was coming from with the research, with the internship task that I was doing. Uh, so as Adam said, my uh, research looked into towns held under the lordship of monasteries and looking at the social relations between the lord and the urban inhabitant. So people outside of academia probably quite often think of monasteries as kind, peaceful institutions, but actually monastic towns have traditionally been characterised by medievalists in terms of robust lordship and violent town happy relations, which uh, some of you are probably uh, familiar with. And there certainly were some extreme acts of violence. Uh, the most iconic might be in the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, when uh, the inhabitants of Bury St Edmunds decapitated the prior of the abbey. Uh, not surprising though, most of the time, things were resolved in a more peaceful manner than this and I chose Reading as a case study for my PhD because despite being the third largest monastic town in England it didn't have these violent outbursts seen in places like Bay St Edmunds so I was trying to look at how the social dynamics worked there and I looked at the years 1350 to 1600 so that I could carry on past the dissolution and see the impact that that event had on urban society because of course in places that had a monastery as a lord the dissolution wasn't just a religious event it was very much an event that had a major political, economic, social and cultural impact on the town. But of course, I'm not here uh, to talk to you today about Reading. I'm here to talk about the work on the internship. And my internship uh, was with working on this uh, smartphone app called A History of English Places. Uh, but that said, it won't surprise you that one of the places I chose to go and uh, visit as part of the internship was in fact uh, Reading. So uh, the things I'll talk about today, I guess I'll talk about the app itself a bit then talk about uh, these walks that I came up with as part of the internship, and then talk a little bit about kind of a reflection on uh, what that can tell us about the VCH approach to history. And also talk a bit about uh, public engagement as well, and how uh, that kind of worked. There we go. So uh, what is a history of English places, first of all? Well, it's designed to be a convenient way to access the content of the Victoria County history. And as I'm sure a lot of you know, this is a project that began in 1899. It produced histories of uh, the English counties, and initially it focused on the themes of topography and religious houses. And then the counties that continued with the work uh, moved on to writing a profile of individual parishes, a task so ambitious that it's still ongoing today. And as the picture shows, uh, where you've got uh, an extensive coverage of the parishes, the volumes can become quite extensive. Uh, so what I've got pictured there is just the Victoria County of History of Oxfordshire. So the app is designed as a more convenient way to access all of this content. And of course, it's also being part of an app that's something that can be used on the go. 
So hopefully some of you may even be tempted to download the app. So I'll give you a quick guide of how it works with a series of in-app screenshots. And one thing to bear in mind as well is this is essentially, I suppose, the first version. And, uh, there are uh, plans for extra features to add to it. So there'll be uh, more things to be able to do at some point, hopefully, with the app. Uh, so after uh, the loading screen, you should see something a little bit like this. I felt bad about uh, cropping out Scotland and Wales from the photo, so I kept them in. But one thing that will stand out from that picture is that, as the name suggests, the app is only uh, for English history. And even more apologies if there is anyone from Northern Ireland listening, because even if I zoomed out, I'm afraid you're not actually on the map. Uh, the first time you use it, it's worth clicking on the three uh, dots in the top left corner. And this uh, will open up the options menu, and then you can tap on uh, the options to switch on to show user location and show the nearest 10 places. And this allows the app to pinpoint where you are and uh, gives labels with the local parishes and uh, towns. One thing you'll notice on the map is that there is a blue dot there. Obviously, Kenilworth should be top of everyone's list of places to visit in England, but that's not actually the reason for the dot being there. Uh, it shows my current location or what my current location was at the time that I took this picture. And there's also a uh, blue arrow coming out from it as well. And what that tells you is that I was looking out of a south facing garden at the time I took the screenshot. So the map becomes more interesting when you zoom in a bit. And now you see the blue dot shows precisely where you're standing. And in this case, it's in Coventry Cathedral. But of course, what is Coventry Cathedral doing on a map because it was destroyed in World War II? Well, the map we're looking at here is the first edition Ordnance Survey map of Coventry. And the first editions of the whole country have been joined together for this app, which makes the map in itself an interesting historical source. Uh, they were created in the years uh, 1883 to 1913. So the age of the map that you'll be looking at depends on where you are in the country at the time. And you can, uh, can click on the blue line in the bottom right corner, and that will toggle between this map view and a satellite image. When you zoom out a little bit more, you'll get a view like this, and you'll notice that there are a number of pins with the names of parishes and towns on them. And if you click on these, they will open a small history of the area. And if you're standing midway between areas, you obviously will have to look at a few different pins to try and work out which is the one that you want. The history that you get at first isn't actually the Victoria County history. Instead, it's taken from Samuel Lewis's Topographical Dictionary of England, which is a book that was published in the mid 19th century. And the reason this has been chose as, chosen as the first thing that you see is that it has uh, a greater coverage of the country. Lewis has entries of almost 14,000 English local areas. Uh, the Victoria County history has profiles for just over 3,000 parishes. But where a VCH profile does exist, there'll be a link at the bottom of the Lewis entry, uh, which you can click on to get the full VCH uh, history of that parish. And you'd have to have the subscribed uh, version of the app uh, to be able to access that. So that explains uh, what the app is, but what was the internship all about? Well, my task was to create a series of posts to appear on the IHR blog that would show the app in use. And the idea was to promote the use of the app so I also need to make contact with local interest groups to try and uh, plug the posts on social media. So the internship advert when I was applying suggested curating some walks. And I decided that I would have a, each post would focus on a walk around a specific locality and looking at the local sites in that area. Because I thought that giving particular places the limelight for the week would be quite an effective way to attract, uh, to attract local interest. I tried to get a geographical spread, so I visited Kenilworth in Warwickshire, Colchester in Essex, Coventry, Buxton in Derbyshire, uh, Bristol, Reading and Oxfordshire. And what you can see at the moment is uh, one of the posts called Bruce Spring Steam, which looks at Buxton. And one of the things you might notice about all the places I listed is that they are, of course, all towns and cities. Rural parishes obviously aren't less worthy of attention, but there were a couple of practical reasons that I focused on urban ones. Uh, one of them is that in urban areas, it's obviously easier to visit a large number of historic sites in a modest sized walk. And the second one is that urban areas are more likely to have local history societies, museums and local newspapers to make contact with. Now, each blog post was uh, linked to a map that I created on Google My Maps. I'm going to try and switch my screen over to that. So, again, hopefully you can see a map of country now, but I'll turn your microphone on and tell me if you can't see anything. And I use put pins onto the maps uh, to show, to highlight each of the places that gets mentioned in the blog post. 
And to make sure that people uh, were actually looking at the right things, there's photographs attached to them. So if I click on this one, it will uh, to give you a photograph, the name of the site and a short kind of uh, description of its origin. So this is my map of a walk around Coventry. Given its reputation, you might not expect to see many pre-war sites, but I did find there are quite a large number tucked away down back streets. And the first one I clicked on here is uh, Chelsmore Manor, which is a 14th century manor house for the Earls of Chester, who were the lords of uh, the manorial lords over half of Coventry in the early medieval period. And nowadays it's become the Coventry Register Office. And if I click on that one, this is Ford's Hospital, which is a 16th century almshouse. And over here we've got uh, Bab Lake School, which originated in the 14th century to house the priest of the nearby uh, church of St John the Baptist. But perhaps most surprisingly of all for Coventry is uh, Spon Street, where we've got a street almost entirely made up of surviving medieval buildings. Uh, one of the things I found as the weeks went on with doing this, I realised there was probably a risk of my post getting a bit repetitive and formulaic. Uh, walks around most English towns will kind of reveal a series of parish churches, a non-conformist church and a 19th century school, and there's a danger that they all might sound a bit the same. So for this reason, in some of the later posts, I tried to pick on a particular theme to focus on uh, for the week. So with the slave trade being a prominent part of Bristol's history, I focused on how uh, the visual townscape is in a large part a testament to the accomplishments of affluent white men. And in Reading, I explored how the town stood at a particular moment in time uh, on the eve of the dissolution of Reading Abbey, a moment that may or may not have been influenced by it being my thesis topic. Yeah, I'll switch back to the presentation now. So having uh, put the app to the test, I'll now talk a bit about what advantages it could actually bring for us for exploring places. Well, combining a historic map with a GPS position proved very useful. Like I said, the map is in itself a very interesting historical source in its own right. And this is most obviously the case with somewhere like Coventry, uh, which has faced a great deal of destruction since the time when the map was created. But it's also true to a lesser extent elsewhere. It became very apparent from my walks that the physical townscape of uh, any town or city is constantly changing. Uh, so when I was uh, looking around Kenilworth, I had some trouble trying to track down the precise location of a building uh, for a 1836 school, which was supposed to still be standing there. But this was helped by using the app. Uh, looking at the map that you can see on the screen, uh, I could see that there was a school marked in bold. So all I had to do was to walk around until the blue dot was over the school to try and identify exactly where that location was. But when I got there, I was a bit surprised to find an empty field, uh, which shouldn't be the case given the school was supposed to still be there. So in fact, it seems that uh, the map was showing yet another school that I didn't know of from the VCH entry, and I probably wouldn't have spotted that without uh, using the map in this way. And just as the map is an interesting historical source, so too are the written entries about the local areas. The Lewis entries were written in the mid 19th century, the Ordnance Survey map at the turn of the 20th century, and the VCH entries range from the early 20th century into the 21st. So as a result, each of these captures a local area at a different moment in time. And this was particularly interesting in the case of Buxton, where the population grew fivefold after the arrival of its railway in 1863. So we talk about quite a different town at each of these different snapshots that we've got. And the town is famous for its spring water and a famous site is St Anne's Well. It's used to this day by residents and visitors. And in fact, I had to wait quite a long time to take this photo because there was someone in front of me with uh, half a dozen very large bottles of water that they wanted, well, no, empty bottles that they wanted to fill up. And this site is meant to have been the site of a well since the Roman era. Uh, the Lewis entry describes how when he was writing, there was a marble basin with both a hot and a cold water pump inside a Grecian style temple. So this clearly isn't the same well that we're seeing when we go there today. And this one actually dates from 1940. Uh, Buxton's also interesting because comparing the Lewis entry with the map shows the impact of the coming of the railway in 1863. Many new buildings appear that simply didn't exist when Lewis was writing. In addition to the station itself, a series of leisure buildings appeared, uh, including an uh, opera house and a concert hall. So normally historians uh, like the idea that people might actually be interested in what we do, uh, but public engagement can be quite difficult. The internship uh, was a useful test of some of the ways that historians might try to engage with the public through uh, efforts like this. So many men members of the public are interested in the places that they live. 
And this is reflected in a site called Geograph that Matt Bristow uh, put me, yeah, made me aware of that I could use for this, where users have uploaded photos of every grid square of Britain and it shows the interest of the public. And here's one I found that was uploaded of Reading's marketplace. There's a monument in the marketplace to mark the site that would have once uh, been the heart of a prosperous trading centre. Public knowledge doesn't always match the level of interest. The user who put this photo up added the caption, Memorial on Marketplace. I don't know what it's a memorial for, but there used to be some underground toilets here, and there probably still are if you look under the paving. So one of the challenges we face is how to repackage histories written for an academic audience, for people like this Geograph user, who would like to know more about the places they live. Uh, the new app allows the Victoria County history to be accessed on the go, but the content would struggle to maybe rival uh, the kind of brief history of a locality that you might get in a lonely planet guide that's been uh, designed for these kinds of people. There just aren't enough people who are interested in who once held the advowson of their holiday destination or how many villains lived there uh, at the time of doomsday. The full entries are realistically going to be primarily of interest uh, to historians and amateur local researchers. But the walks are one way of repackaging some of the findings of the Victoria County history for a non-academic audience. I use the Victoria County history entries to uh, pick out interesting facts or anecdotes for the places but, uh, that I saw, but I try to avoid having an off-putting level of detail about each of them. After each walk, I made contact with the local interest groups, and this was a good uh, test of how receptive different types of readers might be to this sort of project. The responses I got suggest that this sort of output is still primarily of interest to local history enthusiasts, uh, rather than, I guess, the public more widely. Not surprisingly, the most consistently interested groups when I made contact were local history societies. For some of the places I went to, there were amateur researchers who'd set up their own website for the history of their local area. And those people were always uh, keen to add the walk to their site if I made contact with them. I also had some enthusiastic responses from people working in university departments that run community courses. So in uh, Reading and Oxford, there's uh, the, uh, yeah, the Continue Education College in Oxford and uh, equivalent bit in Reading have courses for about local history. Uh, which were quite keen to advertise this to the people who are taking those courses. Uh, I had some uh, positive responses from contacts aimed at me for wider audience, but it's difficult to judge whether this really had any particular impact. So people working in museums, heritage departments of local councils and tourist information centres were happy to uh, retweet the post. But I think academics would, uh, would need a larger project collaborating with these organisations more closely if they really wanted to draw a lot of attention to something from members of the public. One of the lessons I learned was uh, the value of building up long-term connections uh, if you want to have effective public engagement. The place that had uh, by far the most enthusiastic response uh, to the walk that I made was Reading, where I've been actively involved with a local history group called the Friends of Reading Abbey since I started my PhD, and where I've got contacts in the university from having done my master's there. Reworking the contents of the app for a public audience was also an opportunity to reflect on how the VCH approaches local history. Uh, in an era where academics often feel they have to promise research with cutting edge and innovative methodologies to impress funding bodies, the VCH is uh, a, quite a, a rare example of uh, a project that approaches history by looking through all of the records that survive for a local area to try and uh, learn those uh, documents, I guess, inside out, but also the physical remains of an area and the topography uh, in a lot of detail. In some senses, the VCH adopts quite a formulaic approach to local areas. Those who've used the big red books will be familiar with seeing the same section headings recurring, manners and other estates, economic history, local government, and so on. For a researcher dipping into the histories of lots of different communities, uh, which I had to do during my PhD, this standardisation does make them easier to navigate to find the information that you want. And it's also helpful for comparing different communities. But even though it might seem uh, formulaic in a sense, the VCH project has adapted to the changing outlook on history across its 122 year lifetime. The initial plan had been to produce genealogies at each of the county's notable families, but this was only actually fulfilled for Northamptonshire and Hertfordshire before it was abandoned. This was abandoned for financial reasons, but had they gone ahead with that, it also would seem out of line with where historical interests have tended to head over time. The VCH was resurrected in the middle of the 20th century when it tried to cover a broader range of topics with its profiles. And in the 21st century, there's been increased efforts at public engagement. Uh, obviously, we had the, uh, this recent internship, but a big thing before that was a lottery funded project in 2005 to 10 called England's Past for Everyone that aimed to bring local history to life. One of the things that was apparent from my walks is how, despite efforts at standardisation, 
the way in which researchers uh, describe a place will always reflect the age in which they're writing. If you click on the entry for Bristol, it describes the magnificent monument to the memory of Edward Colston, an eminent ph philanthropist and a great benefactor to the city. Colston was, of course, the deputy governor of the Royal African Company, which traded in enslaved people. And in June 2020, his statue spent four days at the bottom of Bristol Harbour. And were the entry being written now, it would undoubtedly be written very differently. One of the lessons that was apparent from exploring Bristol and other uh, local communities is how the physical remains of the past only tell the story of the few. Colston's statue may have gone, but the other buildings and uh, statues are testaments to the wealthiest Bristolians. The city's uh, statuist Samuel Morley, a 19th century liberal MP who campaigned for abolition of slavery, uh, causes less controversy, but it is still commemorating the deeds of uh, an affluent white man from Bristol. Commemorations of the achievements of black Bristolians are harder to find, but they are starting to make an appearance. At Bristol's bus station, there is pictured this plaque uh, unveiled in 2014 uh, to five leading figures of the, Brus uh, the Bristol bus boycott of 1963, which was inspired by Rosa Parks. And there's recently been devised a trail called the Seven Saints of St Paul's, which goes past murals of figures like Carmen Beckford, who was uh, Bristol City Council's first community uh, development officer. The VCH's England's Past for Everyone project uh, that I mentioned before, was, uh, has been in line with uh, this kind of uh, interest uh, from the public. One of the outputs was in fact a book called uh, Bristol Ethnic Minorities in the City, 1000 to 2001. So perhaps for the VCH, if they want to engage with the public more, uh, the future of the project may see more ventures like this, where it's not a case of uh, obviously giving up on the traditional approach, but trying to find ways that it can be uh, repackaged, I guess, for a wider audience. And yes, that's what I was going to talk about today. And I'll be happy to answer questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And uh, that's uh, thank you for the, and thank you for those insights into the project as well as um, into your walks. And um, I put I put this on Twitter, but uh, uh, Joe's walks, if you haven't seen them, um, can be explored here. I'll put the link in the chat just now. So. Um, the whole question's for the end, so if you've got any, please do hold, keep, keep note of them now. Uh, moving on, we're now going to the second speaker, uh, uh, second intern, uh, Vesna Kerwick, who is in her third year of her PhD at the University of Edinburgh, which is examining immigrant encounters with health medicine in Britain, 1880 to 1914. Her interpretation was, was concerned also with the VCH in some ways, but more particularly with um, uh, the Centre's Layers of London project, which um, is, is whose aim is, as the name suggests, to give, provide overlapping mapping for the entire of Greater London, um, particularly in the case of Vesna's internship, to look at the impact of Jewish history and Jewish communities in those mapped contexts. So over to you, Vesna. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen as well, so you can see that. There we go. Should be able to see that. Okay, uh, wonderful. Okay, so good evening, everybody, and thank you all very much for joining us. Um, and thank you uh, for that kind introduction as well. Um, this evening, I want to talk, as Joe did, about my experience as an intern with the IHR. And it's been such a pleasure to work on this project. Um, and so I'm really excited to be speaking about this experience. Uh, so to give you a little sense of what I'll do today, I will start by telling you a bit about the project and my own research background, and then I'll turn to discussing um, the parts of the project that I found very personally valuable, as well as the parts that I think will be most valuable for the users of the collection. And in doing that, I will also share some of the really fascinating locations and stories that I uncovered in my research. And to give you some background, my internship project, as Adam mentioned, um, sought to create a collection of historical locations in London that were central to Jewish life. The project brought together two large scale IHR housed projects, Layers of London and Victoria County History. Over the co course of eight weeks or so, I was tasked with mapping various significant locations onto the layer of London, Layers of London website using a data set that was extracted from the BCH. And in addition to this data from the BCH, 
I was encouraged to bring in some of my pre-existing knowledge and my own research into this collection. So um, Joe actually did a very good job of introducing um, the VCH. So I maybe we'll jump right to introducing you um, to Layers of London. So uh, Layers of London is an interactive digital history project that invites users to explore locations in London throughout the city's history. Users can view uh, London through the lens of different map layers, ranging from medieval London to modern satellite maps. Users can also create their own entries in the map, effectively creating personal or public landmarks on the map, which then others can pursue, peruse, sorry. Um, and being able to work across both of these really enormous and enduring projects was very exciting and very intellectually stimulating. I was lucky because I was given a lot of freedom to design the collection how I wanted. And I think the collection um, really reflects a combination of my own areas of interest and the areas of interest that the VCH focuses on. So because this collection does reflect quite a lot of my own research, I think it makes sense to introduce myself a bit more carefully as well. Um, I'm a PhD student based at the University of Edinburgh and my research center is on 19th and 20th century uh, migration to Britain and specifically the medical experiences of those immigrants. More broadly, I'm interested in the way that race and ethnicity and ideas about foreignness played out in medical and scientific contexts. I consider myself both a historian of medicine and a historian of migration in pretty much equal regard. And when I applied to this internship, I had just finished writing two chapters about the court and the process of medical inspection for immigrants within the court, which was a procedure introduced by the 1905 Aliens Act. The Aliens Act, which is the first modern piece of immigration legislation, introduced financial and medical restrictions on immigration, largely in response to migration of Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe. And in fact, these, Im these migrants were in fact perhaps better characterized as refugees uh, because many were fleeing from religious, economic, and social persecution. This background is useful for you, I think, uh, because a lot of the institutions I selected for my collections are naturally informed by this area of research. A lot of the institutions I selected have at least tangential relationships to immigration, and a lot of the collection is centered in the late 19th and early 20th century, although I do obviously discuss some institutions and locations that have histories going back much further, and others have um, anecdotes that reach even to present day. So my background also means that I came into this project with a good foundation of knowledge about certain types of institutions that were central to Jewish communities. For example, I knew a lot about Jewish charities and community philanthropic organizations. I knew less about locations to do, I, I knew, sorry, I knew a lot to do with locations to do with migration like ports and medical institutions like hospitals. But I knew less about uh, religious institutions, for example, like synagogues, which was good in a way because the VCH records were almost exclusively focused on synagogues. So obviously the VCH data really influenced uh, the direction of my research. And in some cases, quite unexpectedly. When I started this internship, I received a spreadsheet compiled by a previous intern with a long list of community synagogues accompanied by um, information for each of them. Uh, and that information was often at least their founding date, location, and closure date if applicable. Uh, these records were interspersed with longer community histories that were linked to particular neighborhoods instead of particular synagogues. And all of this data was pulled um, directly out of the VCH um, databases. In these records, I saw uh, constant rec uh, references to the United Synagogue and the Federation of Synagogues, for example, saying when one or the other opened a church in a certain area, but little explanation as to what these organizations were. Though I'd heard of both of these organizations, um, I didn't really know all that much about them or their history, so this required a little bit of a research detour in my part. And so if you're really familiar with London's Jewish history, this is probably very familiar to you, but in case you're not, here's a brief um, story about the founding of these two synagogue organizations. The United Synagogue was founded in 1870 as a formal union between the largest Ashkenazi Orthodox synagogues in London. The organization sought to better organize and expand the Orthodox Jewish community within the city, and in doing so was deeply influential on the construction and development of new synagogues during its 
um, early years. At the same time, however, as I mentioned earlier, the end of the 19th century saw a significant influence, uh, influx of Jewish immigrants, many of whom were from very rural parts of Eastern Europe. These immigrant communities in London began to worship in their own smaller congregations, often in private homes or without a set meeting place. This was in large part due to a sense that the a, a sense amongst these immigrant communities that the existing synagogues in London, especially those under the purview of the United Synagogue, were too anglicized. By 1887, the Federation of Synagogues was established to represent, develop, and bring together these smaller immigrant uh, makeshift synagogues. So this was obviously a central part of synagogue organization in the late 19th century, and yet in the VCH records, it's only mentioned in passing. However, I realized that a more accurate way of thinking about this was that these organizations were hidden in plain sight, so central to this history that they didn't need explaining. And I want to emphasize that this isn't a failing on the part of the VCH volumes, far from it. In fact, it, this is a normal part of historical research, but it was important for me to remember the purpose of the VCH records and the background knowledge that those historians had, which Joe also alluded to. In fact, in my experience, a huge part of historical work, especially when writing marginalized histories, is just figuring out what our sources know that we don't, and this was a good reminder of this fact. I want to turn now to the thing that really uh, attracted me to this internship project, which is also one of the things that I think will be really valuable um, for the layers of London users who will use this collection. The cartographic nature of this project really brings to light the, phys the, the physicality behind these histories. Being able to see how close or far two places are can really emphasize how certain historical events happened. I'll turn now to a case study that really illustrates this. As I mentioned above, in 1905, the Aliens Act introduced restrictions to immigration and migrants could now be rejected for their financial status or their health. But the Aliens Act also encoded a system of appeals for rejected migrants. So if a migrant was rejected, they could meet with their local immigration board to appeal that decision. In London, the immigration board met at Blackwell Docks and was made up of men having magisterial, business, or administrative experience. Three members were present to adjudicate at any given time and uh, from a group of 20 or so men. And in these hearings, the board would listen to the migrant plead their case, listen to testimonials from friends or philanthropic organizations, and ultimately decide on the migrant's fate. Physically, these hearings happen in very makeshift and unwelcoming setting. The Jewish Chronicle, an influential and pro-immigrant newspaper, reported that the board was condemned to uh, convene in a, quote, mean and out of the way building made up of abandoned shipping offices condemned by critics as, quote, one of the most cheerless and out of the way spots in all of London, and quote, the location was convenient for nobody. The board's physical proximity to the port also caused unique inconveniences in some cases, with remarks that on rainy days, the key would flood right to the base of the building where the hearings were held, making visits to the building a complicated process. This not only affected the reputation of the board, but also had a real impact on the administration of the act, since the inconvenient location was regularly made the, uh, re regularly made the process of meeting quorum a difficult one, especially in those cold winter months. There was no waiting room for witnesses um, who were forced to walk up and down the quay to keep warm, and this was dangerous in the best of times, but as one Jewish Chronicle correspondent put it, quote, what may happen to them in a thick fog with a high tide, I shudder to think, end quote. The isolation of the board had consequences of, for outcomes of migrants, often limiting rapid communication with key mediators or immigration advocates. For a while, there was no telephone at Blackwall and it was too far to quickly get messages across in other ways. For example, the Jewish Board of Guardians employed a staff of people who were very well connected with the London's East End Jewish community, um, who were able to verify stories or collect evidence for an immigrant's case if needed, but the lack, um, the, the physical distance of the immigration offices made the mobilization of these services difficult to implement in reality. 
This case study illustrates a really valuable, though somewhat intangible element of this internship project, uh, which I think is valuable for both me and the people who will use this collection. The cartography element of this project allows me to better conceptualize how far certain places were and really drives home feelings of isolation or in other cases, um, feelings of togetherness that historical subjects might have felt. I also tried to project my interest in physical space into this internship, which comes out quite naturally in a lot of the DCH records as well. You can see that in some of the collection descriptions. I was enchanted by any rich interior descriptions where authors would describe, for example, the, uh, what the inside of a synagogue looked like or felt like. And I'm most proud of the entries where I was get, able to get across a feeling of what the space was actually like, how it felt to be there. And I think the desire to be in the place where history occurred is a feeling shared by many other historians and history buffs. This is the thing that draws us into historical fiction, both in novels and on TV. There is some sort of desire for the atmospheric when it comes to history, especially community histories. And I think this project and the layers of London and BCH in general really give a unique window into the physicality of historical research. Also, it's important to note, I think, that I have been working remotely for this entire internship. I actually started the internship um, in my family home in Toronto, Canada, and finished it here in my flat in Edinburgh. This spatial aspect adds a whole other dimension to my contributions. If I wasn't walking, um, I wasn't walking those same London streets when I was writing about them. In many ways, because of the pandemic, historical maps and descriptive writing have been some of my best insights into the physical part of my research, both for my thesis and for this uh, internship. The pandemic era and the remote nature of this work also made me wonder how this collection would have been different if I was London-based during the time. I wonder, for example, how a chance encounter in the street chatting with a stranger or spotting the odd memorial plaque might have changed the direction of my research. The other part of this project that I think is really interesting and valuable is the ability to use the BCH records and layers of London to tell really broad variety of stories. It helps in many ways to bring marginalized stories to more public audiences. And I think this functions on two separate levels. First, I found myself thinking about the fact that a lot of the research I wrote up um, not including the VCH, was previously behind paywalls. So some of my research, for example, draws on the Jewish Chronicle, which is behind a paywall. And a lot of the secondary sources too that I drew on um, were uh, drawn from history written in academic journal or journals or monographs, um, some of which are even out of print or difficult to find or else prohibitively expensive. I found it really valuable to use these um, platforms and my institutional access and my existing knowledge to bring these case studies to an open access platform. This was also a really valuable contrast to writing the process of writing a PhD thesis, which I am in the middle of, um, and which is a genre that has many of its own merits, but sadly doesn't often reach a wider audience. And the other level um, is about the stories themselves. The layers part of Layers of London really rings true here, not just layers in a chronological sense, but also in the sense of lost or buried histories. I had a few interesting case studies about institutions that served very vulnerable and underprivileged people whose stories have largely been lost to the historical record. My work, and more importantly, the work of the historians who came before me, has done a lot in terms of recovering these histories. Take, for example, the case of the Sarah Pike House. Located in Great Prescott Street, Sarah Pike House was a home for vulnerable Jewish women and girls, especially Eastern European immigrants who were new to London. Um, the organization that ran the Sarah Pike House, the Jewish Association for the Protection of Girls and Women, uh, was largely concerned with ideas of white slavery, the euphemistic Victorian term for sex trafficking or sex work. And it's important to note that no distinction was made between the consensual and non-consensual activities. Um, the organization was committed to a variety of activities, including providing male chaperones for signal migrant women arriving in London, providing safe, safe accommodation for vulnerable women, and providing social and moral education to women to help them gain skills for other employment. 
Many of these activities happened at the Sarah Pike House in the 1880s and 1890s, and as the association grew, so did its property holdings. By the early 20th century, um, the JAPGW also maintained a domestic training facility at Highbury Home and an industrial school for Jewish girls. The identities of the women who resided at the Sarah Pike House are largely unknown, but generations of historians before me have worked to put what is known on paper. I'm grateful that this internship in turn has allowed me to put these stories onto another open access platform where curious users might just naturally stumble upon them. And so briefly, I think there's a lot of room for growth in this collection, and I'm eager to share some of my future visions for this collection and for Jewish histories on layers of London in general. One thing I would love to see is more community or memory-based work added to this collection or future Jewish history collections. The VCH data demonstrated that there are or were just so many small synagogues that were relatively short-lived or quickly got um, combined into larger synagogues. The data tells stories about offshoot groups and small groups of worshipers who worshiped in private homes. I find these types of stories absolutely fascinating. People who didn't let a lack of infrastructure stop their beliefs and cultural traditions. Personally, one of the things I find most fascinating on Layers of London is reading the personal stories and individual memories. And I tried to infuse some of this into my own work, but I was obviously limited by the existing historical records. So I would love to see people write their own memories of these community institutions, either as one-off contributions to the collection or as longer, more sustained community oral history projects, for example. This also links to another direction of expansion that I'd love to see. I'd love to see more um, investigation into wider time periods. And also, I would love to see more unexpected locations of Jewish history. A lot of this collection is dominated by places where the importance to Jewish life was explicit, um, places, for example, like synagogues or charities. And I'm particularly proud of some of the locations in this collections that collection that weren't explicitly related to Jewish lives, but still had a major impact, like the Blackwell Docks, for example. I would love to see more people add in locations that are somewhat unexpected or not explicitly related to Jewish religious life, but had an impact on the cultural or social communities. And so I leave you now by saying that the collection is open for the public to edit meaning that members of the Layers of London community are free to add their own entries to the Jewish Histories um, collection. And so I encourage anyone in the audience who might have found this interesting to do so. And I'm also interested to hear any thoughts or questions you might have. Um, and you're, of course, welcome to email me after today's session as well with any further thoughts or ideas you might have. And so thank you all very much for listening. And thank you once again to the IHR and the Center for People, Place, and Community um, for hosting me on this internship. Thank you, Vesna. That was really terrific. And thank you, Joe, uh, for, for, for your contribution as well. Um, both um, hugely thought provoking, not only you know, from the material that I was particularly discussing, uh, but also from my viewpoint, from my perspective as an editor, into how wary we must be about assumed knowledge and what we write in our histories. Um, so that's my takeaway from that. Do we have any questions? No. Okay. <clears throat> well, um, I've got a, I've, I have one or two. Um, first, for Vesna, if I may, which is um, I was particularly taken with that idea about you. You addressed right towards the end of your talk about um, finding Jewish histories where you don't expect to see them. I thought that was a really interesting. Could you actually unpack? Could you unpack that a little bit more? Um, either that. Could that be emotional? Could that be geographic? Of course, of course you know, so very different parts of London, and how that and how those sort of the areas where you might expect to find the change over time. Yeah. So um, when I was thinking about that, I was thinking in part um, places like Blackwell Docks, where you know Blackwell Docks has a long history as an East Indian um, dock, and so it has this whole life before it becomes. Um, a place that's central to early 20th century Jewish life. Um, so things like that, I think, are really interesting. Um, there's also another level to that. Um, I guess this is less of an unexpected um, Jewish history location, but it does speak to your question about um, change over time. So 
Um, for example, I had a couple examples, one of which was the Spitafields uh, Great Synagogue, which was before it was a synagogue, it was a Protestant church um, for you know many, many years. And then it was a synagogue for many, many years. And now it's a mosque. And so I think that's quite an interesting trajectory. Um, and so maybe if you were walking around London, you might look at a mosque and not realize that it has this whole, you know, really interesting religious uh, history uh, besides what it is just today. And then finally, the other sort of element of um, unexpected histories, for example, I'm thinking of another collection that's on Layers of London um, that was done by uh, some folks over at the Jewish Museum in London. They did a cool, a collection of Jewish owned shops. And so you can look at this whole collection um, of places that aren't explicitly, not always at least, um, like Jewish centers for cultural or um, religious life, but in fact are very unexpected um, centers for Jewish cultural life where you might have been able to buy certain foods or certain products that um, were especially important for, for example, immigrant communities. Thank you for that person. Um, a good question from Sally Dixon Smith. Oh, hello. Um, sorry. Um, thank you very much for your paper. Talking about unusual places, I wondered if you were aware at all of work by Dr. Nadia Valman at Queen Mary. Um, so I, I used to, before COVID, I used to be a curator at the Tower of London. And we worked together, I'd been looking particularly at the Tower of London um, and its role within the Jewish, the medieval Jewish, Jewish community in London and um, as a point of expulsion in 1290. And she had been looking particularly at Jewish immigration. So basically the point of expulsion was at one end of what's now Tower Wharf. And she'd been looking at immigration in the period you're interested in, in at, at the point which is now right under Tower Bridge. It's actually, it's actually called Dead Man's Hole because rather re revoltingly, it used to be where um, bodies washed up if people were in the river just because of the nature of the currents. I was cheerfully informed by someone that today that happens by HMS Belfast. But anyway, um, so, so we were looking, we, were, we worked together and we, we did actually uh, do a walk for the Thames Festival and we did various sort of joint research. And I, I just thought that was interesting because people don't associate the Tower of London with Jewish history generally um, but there is a lot um, in various ways but also thank you both for your papers because I think when you do some of the sort of public engagement and community engagement particularly walks and all those sorts of things which are fabulous they're obviously they are ephemeral and I really enjoyed what what Joe was saying, showing about how to map them and how to put them on, you know, and what you were saying about layers of London and all that sort of stuff. I I have I have played around with layers of London, but I shall look more because I think, um, particularly for um, medieval history and Jewish community in London, there's there's a lot that could be put on. I mean, another weird and interesting place is um, it's now part of King's College London Library. Prior to that, it was um, the National Archives um, before it moved out to Kew. Um, but originally, it, it's a building that was built as um, the House of the Converts, the Domus Conversorum. So for uh, particularly London Jews, but Jewish people generally who had converted to Christianity, it's this sort of strange quasi religious house but also support system but the fact that it, it, it it's gone through because after it stopped being the the house of the converts it then came under the chan chancery department of government and then has become a place to store chancery roles and subsequently the public record office and subsequently part of a university library but it's you know if you go in there's only a bit of the building left but you can see an archway when you're within the library so there are i really like like you were identifying these 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 places that have had multiple uses um, and, you know, particularly with, with uh, the former Chancery Lane Public Record Office, of course, it stored an awful lot of the records that medieval historians look at um, to look at the medieval Jewish community. So, you know, it's, it's all these things running through. But I thought it was, I thank you so much for both talks. I thought excellent and I, I just I like this idea of these things which can 
have wonderful community engagement and you have a big surge of interest and then it's kind of forgotten and the idea that there are ways um, through the platforms you were talking about to um, give these greater longevity but also greater access that it's not you know a one-off two-off event anyway that was all I want to say so it's not really a question I'm sorry <laughs> but yes um, do do look at Nadia Valman if you haven't before and her work yeah thank you so much for that those insights are so interesting and actually like when I was writing some of those entries I really um, you know rude the fact that I'm not a medievalist because there is such an interesting medieval Jewish community history as well um, that I think it could be its whole own internship um, and, and yes um, I'm really aware of um, Dr. Nadia Valman she co-edited a really um, a book that I use quite a lot in my PhD research uh, which is entitled The Jew in Late Victorian and Edwardian Culture Between East Asia and East Africa and I think if you're interested in this um, subject at all more broadly and sort of spatial um, conceptions of Jewish history. Uh, this is a really wonderful book um, because it it brings together some really interesting uh, voices, including Dr. Wallman. So yeah, thank you for that. But but yeah, that I completely agree with you. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Uh, that was that was a really interesting set of insights there. Nice got to go into this. Colin, I see uh, Colin Runnicles, I see, has put a point on Twitter about restaurants. And so, you know, would, would you like to ask that one in person, Colin? Or not? No. no? Okay. Uh, Colin was uh, Colin was asking um, on Twitter. Um, would these would, would, would locations of say Jewish identity in particular, but also of other communities, um, include things like apologies, I've got a research assistant in the room. Um, uh, would include things like um, uh, Jewish restaurants, say, or, or uh, food or kosher supermarkets, perhaps more recent years. Yeah, I, I think that that could. I mean, um, clearly, I have many ideas because I think that could be. Okay internship in and of itself okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah I would be really I think food is something that okay. I don't really explore that much in my research as sort of like a community center point and so restaurants obviously are a huge part of that um, food like um, the availability, availability for example of kosher food is such a big thing in this period and um, as I was saying I work with the Jewish Chronicle quite often and while it's not my main area of interest I can't help but look at some of those advertisements for shops and so I could really see some interesting work being done in sort of the way that Jewish food and um, other sort of products were advertised to the community and the availability of these things uh, for example you know, if you lived in West London, far away from the immigrant community, were certain things hard to find? Um, I think there is like a very interesting spatial element um, to do with with food and restaurants and shops as well. So yeah, I would I would love to know more about that. But I, I just I just didn't it didn't come across in my research really. So yes, thank you for that. that was, <laughs> sorry, I've been invaded. <laughs> <laughs> the joys of working from home and still more chairing a Peter seminar from home. Anyway, uh, Peter Hounsell. Yeah, this was really a comment rather than a question, but it linked together both your areas of work. And I was thinking about the problem with the Victoria County history, as you were saying, Joe. It's it's a moment. It's written at a moment in time, and the world moves on. And some BCHs are much obviously much older than others. Um, where I live in Greenford in West London, we used to have a Jewish synagogue, but we don't have any more. But the, the BCH will record the Jewish synagogue because it was there when the BCH for this area was written. It then went through, the building was then taken over by a Hindu temple. But the Hindu temple has now demolished the original building, the original synagogue, which they used and built a quite elaborate building in an Indian uh, architectural style, which now looks just as incongruous, maybe in in the streets of Greenford, as 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 the synagogue was very plain and therefore had no had no impact. Although I always wondered, since the area didn't seem to have any significant Jewish community that you could identify otherwise, other than they used a synagogue. But of course, say that's how the BC that's how it's remembered 
if you associate, if you look at the BCH, but of course the building that it's talking about is no longer there. Yeah, this is something that's really interesting. I'm actually going to post a um, uh, citation for an article I read about this during my research um, from 1992, and it talks. It's called "Squandered Heritage: Jewish Buildings in Britain," and it has some really mm. interesting discussions. It centers on one case study um, about the East End uh, East End Synagogue that, in the 1980s gets sold and turned into apartment buildings with no consultation from the local Jewish community. And so um, the author of this article is talking a lot about um, how that is just such a shame and that there isn't really like an organized um, cultural preservation center for um, places like synagogues. And so this obviously was written in 1992. And so I think probably things have changed quite a lot in terms of um, cultural like heritage preservation, but um, it, it speaks to a lot of the same points. And actually, I'd be quite interested to know, Joe, um, about if you had many instances, I know you talked about that school that was there and wasn't there. And so I'd really be interested to know your thoughts on this subject as well. Yeah, so I suppose, like I said, it never entirely got to the bottom of, with the school, actually, I'll have to yeah, do some more delving around about that to see whether that was just another building the same school had uh, nearby or whether it was actually a completely different school that seems to have not been mentioned, I haven't yeah, entirely got to the bottom of that, but it's definitely not, yeah, it's not just the GPS being out or something like that, it is in the wrong place if you look at the map as well, according to where uh, the actual school building is now. Um, yeah, so, uh, but I suppose in terms of, you're saying obviously about it, PCH is just one of several different like snapshots in, in time, there's, I suppose with this app, we've been, uh, been talking with Matt and there's some other, I guess, layers that might get added to that as well, that would, again, Give us a slightly different uh, perspective or a, a different time. So one possible thing is, uh, I guess, uh, the Historic England website that has the list of buildings database, and uh, people who've used that might be familiar with the fact that that uh, has an interactive map as well, where you can uh, click on particular sites and it will give you the list of buildings. And integrating that will then give you sort of a different moment in time and sort of a different perspective on uh, engaging with the uh, environment that might be something that might get integrated into the app at a later point but then again even with that of course that's always written at a snapshot in time I suppose that's something that should in theory get updated but I know certainly from uh, writing my post on box and I got uh, told off for using slightly uh, yeah out of date names for particular buildings uh, which I yeah I suppose as an outsider I didn't realize this but the ones that that wasn't what it should be called so I guess even with that it's not going to be uh, something that's entirely up to date and again kind of I guess giving you a perspective of how something looked at a moment in time. Yes, I and mean, that snapshot thing is, I mean, you see it actually in the, list, in the listing data as well. I mean, the listing data will refer to the business that was occupying a building when the listing was done. It's very seldom updated subsequently, um, which can be quite amusing. Um, you think, well, that business went bust 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, if it's a national chain store, for example. Um, but such things are, are not unknown and uh, also the school it's not entirely impossible the vth might have got that one wrong it does happen um we, well we, actually this is i suppose based on the what i'm comparing there is literally the physical building that i can see has got a plaque on the side of it saying the national school but then on the ordnance survey map it is on the opposite side of the street actually that what's marked the school building there now of course it's possible ordnance survey got it wrong is that uh, one possibility i guess or, or it moved over the road yeah. in intervening years. Yeah, I, mean, this, this, I mean this is actually one of the sort of hmm. i think one of, one of the great Thing, one, of, one of the sort of utilities of the app actually is to aid research you know you can actually go and say what does the history say well what can you see on the map and what's the difference in time between those points and what's changed subsequently you know it gives you it gives you a set of fixed points a set of things to negotiate with um but this is dangerous to me talking shop has anybody any more sensible questions than me sort of wittering on no um, okay, well, um, thank you so much to both Joe and to Vesna for their, you know, really stimulating, interesting talk and their interesting work too, which um, lives on um, in Layers of London and on the IHR web 